right? If one's view is that God is a supernatural and omnipotent deity who determines all of his followers to affirm false beliefs about ultimate reality, then why should we care about who this deity brings back to life? I, I just want to say, uh, before we get going into the questions that you guys have for me, yeah, you know, uh, um, I know that you're going to be asking me a lot of questions that were raised during your interview with Colton Carlson. Yeah. And so I want to just be clear that I, uh, in my response here, I'm, I am not attacking Colton or any other Calvinist or determinist or compatibilist personally, right? I think uh, most of the questions you're going to be asking me today are specifically addressing things that Colton has said on your show. So I just want to be clear. I respect Colton and love Colton. I am not attacking Colton. I am merely attacking the view he thinks is true. And so I want people to see uh, the difference there. Um, and I, I, I want to say a few other uh, things, some nice things <laughs> about Colton. Um, I got to tell you, although he's not an official philosopher or an academic in this field, wow, he is extremely well read. Uh, he deserves praise. So let's talk about dessert responsibility here <laughs> and dessert uh, praiseworthiness. He deserves praise for the amount of reading that he's done on this topic. And, and I think that Colton is very smart. His IQ is probably off the chart. And uh, the guy is a brother in Christ. Um, so I just want him and everybody watching to know uh, that I highly respect him. And, uh, you know, and to have a little bit of fun, um, I'll say uh, what's really nice about Colton is he allows me to live rent free in his head. And <laughs> now, now I'll tell you, this, that's actually a compliment. Um, because this is what I, I mean, it's, it blows my mind, but if I write or say anything, it seems Colton will take the time to make a lengthy video or, uh, write a, a 500 page response on an online document <laughs> interacting with me. So that that's just very impressive. He does a lot of hard work and thinks about it apparently, uh, Quite often. Now, I, I will say, although I think he misses some of my important points and winds up talking past me at times, I, I highly respect the fact that this, uh, this young man, this math teacher in Arizona, who happens to hold opposing theological views, takes this theological topic so seriously and then takes so much time uh, to respond to virtually everything I say. I'm sure he'll respond to this video as well. In fact, he's, he's provided so much material that I've, I've really had to stop uh, reading his writings and, and watching his, vid his videos because it's almost like a, a TLDR that you see um, on Facebook or whatever. Uh, that stands for too long, didn't read. I, I just finally had to stop. And don't get me wrong, I've followed much of what he, what he said, and I've read a considerable amount of his writings, um, and I think he's made some good points. But... I discovered that so much of his responses I thought were missing the mark and he was not understanding what I was advancing. And, you know, and, and that's, that's all right. He can't be perfect. He's, and he's not an academic in the field. So, you know, I, I get grace there, but after responding to a few things that Colton has written on my website and my YouTube channel, um, I've now decided to, I will respond in writing now only to what actual scholars uh, right in response because I just don't have time uh, for anything else. Um, and I have done that. If you go to my YouTube channel and uh, 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 my website, you'll, you'll see these things. But JP Moreland, uh, kind of my partner in crime now, is, is recognized as one of the most influential philosophers in the world. And, and he and I have discussed this and what we should respond to. And, and we've decided that moving forward, uh, since we have contributed to the literature and making our case, and we've got more coming, by the way, we're not done yet, uh, but we have contributed to the literature and making our case. Uh, so we will respond to scholars who actually contribute to the literature and opposing our case. But with that said, I tell people, um, if they think that Colton has made some interesting points responding to me, then send me a question and I will respond in the form of a blog or a video. 
And I believe that's exactly what we're going to be doing today in this video. So all that to say, I respect Colton. He is my brother in Christ. I am not attacking Colton. I'm simply attacking the view he thinks is true. And I think Colton would say uh, the same thing about me. So with that said, uh, ask away. Yeah. So the question um, that, that was asked and, and the point was right at the beginning, uh, what are, where I really want to hit on. So Colton asks, how does one get from necessit necessitating events based <laughs> on antecedent conditions or prior events for, for our audience uh, and not having the ability to do otherwise? How does that equal force? Can So, Tim, can you tell us exactly what you mean whenever you say force and how the concept of being forced to do something is linked to being necessitated to do something, given the fact that other libertarians tell us that we shouldn't think like this? Well, first of all, I'm my own libertarian, uh, so I'm not so concerned with what others may or may not think. Uh, I'm going to define my terms, craft my arguments, and make my case. And that's what I do. So my case is that it's true by definition. Multiple definitions of force uh, can be found in online dictionaries. So just type in force definition in Google and multitudes of definitions are going to come up. So uh, the other day I did that and one of the first ones that came up, uh, here's, here's a definition of force. Uh, quote, force, let me, oh, okay, let me get that here. All right, force is an external agent capable of changing a body's state of rest or motion, All right? Force is an external agent capable of changing a body's state of rest or motion. So on ed or exhaustive divine determinism for those watching, we're talking about the idea that God determines everything, not just some things, not just physical actions, but everything, even your mental actions. So I call that exhaustive divine determinism, and I abbreviate that by saying ed, E-D-D, -D, okay? Mm -hmm. So on ed, God is this external agent who does not only necessitate how a body moves, but also how the mind moves, as it were. Uh, exactly how you think, the, uh, the manner in which one reasons well or poorly, and, and ultimately exactly what you believe. Now, here's the first definition of force from Merriam-Webster. Uh, strength or energy, talking about power, exerted or brought to bear a cause of motion or change, active power. So let's think about the Kalam cosmological argument. With the Kalam in mind, it's not an inadequate use of language to say that God forced the universe into existence. Right? This is because God used his active power to bring the universe and necessitate it into existence. So if Ed is true, God's active power determines and necessitates all things and all events. Not only the existence of the universe, but then all of even Colton's false theological beliefs. I'm sure he'll be the first one to tell you that he's not theologically um, infallible or inerrant, right? So he's even got some false theological beliefs. Well, God determines those. God determines Colton to go to scripture and interpret it in such a way that it leads to his false theological beliefs. And nobody dies with a perfect, a perfect set of theological beliefs. Um, we could also say that uh, God determines and forces all of Colton's sins, right? Uh, so since God is using his active power to necessitate Colton's false and sinful thoughts, it's fair to say that God is forcing Colton to think incorrectly and sinfully. After all, an omnipotent God could have used his power uh, differently. Now, uh, to be clear, I'm not discussing the other kind of, or the other definition of force, which is being uh, forced against one's will, right? That's the kind of force that Calvinists are always talking about. Uh, James White made that clear in our debate last year. It was, uh, uh, I think Andrew brought, brought that uh, debate up. It was actually a year ago from tomorrow that we had that debate. Wow. And uh, yeah, so White, you know, I, I was talking about uh, one thing and, you know, being uh, necessitated that that use of force. And then White was like, well, we're not being forced against our will. And I'm like, that's not the case I'm making. That's a different definition. But when you think about it, I'm sure that Colton 
does not desire to hold false theological beliefs. But, I mean, it'd be weird to say, I, yes, I desire to have false theological beliefs. Now, I'm sure he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want or desire false theological beliefs. But on Ed, God determines or forces Colton to hold false theological beliefs against his will. So I think we can also make a case on this other definition of force that Calvinists are often appealing to. But ultimately, I'm merely noting that there is nothing inappropriate with you with uh, using the word force when referring to X if God uses his power to necessitate X. Right. Uh, X would not have happened otherwise. Uh, God necessitated the occurrence of X can also mean that God forced X to occur. And based upon definitions found in dictionaries, this use of the word is not inappropriate whatsoever. Now, uh, Dr. Victor Reppert has used this exact same tactic to defend C.S. Lewis's use of the word irrational in his original argument from reason back in the 1940s. Uh, which, by the way, the argument uh, C.S. Lewis's argument from reason is a precursor to the free thinking argument, which I've advanced with J.P. Moreland. So, the free thinking argument is part of the larger family of these arguments from reason. But anyway, I'm following uh, Dr. Victor Reppert's lead, and I'll say this much: if one uses the word force in the context that I've prov uh, provided just now, we, we ought to be clear as to what we mean by that term. And that's what I do. That's exactly what I strive to do. Uh, and so it'd just be, you know, it's nice when uh, we can uh, use words, tell people exactly what we mean by that. I'm trying to do it. I encourage everybody to do the same. But it seems to me uh, that, that often um, it seems to me that some determinists and compatibilists prefer the waters to stay uh, muddy um, instead of striving for philosophical precision. And I've got some articles and videos um, discussing that if people want to go to my website or my YouTube yeah. channel. And I got to say, I'm not perfect at it either. I, I make mistakes, but I've got to say that it is my greatest desire to uh, strive for philosophical precision. Um, uh, I really desire that. That's one reason why... Um, you know, uh, Michael Preciado and I were supposed to have a debate on on your channel, and I was I was wanting the most philosophical precision possible. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, the debate kind of fell apart after that. So uh, it didn't happen. But bottom line, I'll just say this: uh, if God uses His power to necessitate your false beliefs, it's fair to say that God forced you to affirm false beliefs. So yeah, it's. What do you guys think? You know, given our last episode with Colton and the distinctions that he made whenever it came to different ways that God determined how things happen, whether it was deficient or efficient, I mm -hmm. think both of those ways fall into what you're saying here, Tim, because even though, and I can see this, how a Calvinist that hears someone say force either can imply one of two things, one against one's will in some way, mm -hmm. shape or form, or two in an active kind of only efficient sense. But whenever you take the concept and it, say it like you do, and I, I'm really thankful for the way that you bring out determinism, not only in your book, but or, or define determinism, not only in your book, but in other podcasts that you do as well as antecedent conditions necessitate X, right? Yeah. So I think that brings this whole picture um, full, full circle, really, because mm -hmm. God necessitates something. God necessitates X to occur. It doesn't matter if he does it efficiently or deficiently. That's irrelevant right. at this point. What mm -hmm. matters is, is that God is doing something, whether omitting or actively causing something uh, to necessitate X. Yeah, I, I, I don't yeah. see a difference there, to be yeah. honest. An event is determined if antecedent conditions are sufficient to necessitate the event. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, and I've, I've made this clear. I've even explained this to Colton in the past. I'm like, determinism is determinism, right? With that definition in mind, an, an event is determined yeah. if antecedent conditions are sufficient to necessitate the event. It doesn't matter if you throw the word efficient or deficient 
or primary or secondary means or anything else in there. Determinism is determinism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Josh, what do you think? Uh, I, I'm, I'm remembering the uh, initial exchange with Colton about the word force and his dislike of the implications. Uh, and his main emphasis on the implication was external to internal use of force amounting to something like metaphysical handcuffs. And uh, in the comments, mm -hmm. somebody uh, had condensed this pretty well, I think, said sometimes those who object to the term force do so on the basis that it implies against one's will. But determinism is about necessitating things regardless of one's will, hence force. And so I thought that was a really great way of condensing that problem. So Colton appeals to Tempe and says that determinism does not necessarily get rid of our causal role in the causal sequence. We do have a role, volitions, moderate reasons, responsiveness, and all that plays a part in my action. So my question for him is, do you disagree with Colton ultimately Tempe at this point? And so how exactly does determinism do away with our causal role in the causal sequence of events? According to Colton's view, Colton's so-called role is that of a caused cause, right? And that's the only role supposedly played by Colton if God determines all things, if exhaustive divine determinism is true. Uh, that's why libertarian freedom fighters <laughs> um, often compare determinists to falling dominoes, which is another analogy that uh, they hate. But Again, we're talking about everything being determined. So at the best, the best here that Colton has, the best role that he's got is a caused cause. So again, this is why we've got to focus on the E of Ed. According to Colton's view, any so-called role Colton plays is determined and necessitated by another agent. Uh, the exact manner in which Colton finds himself interacting with the premise of an argument or any interlocutor is determined and necessitated by antecedent conditions, uh, antecedent conditions determined by another guy, another agent. So, I mean, let that sink in. Let me, let me talk about, uh, CS Lewis again in his book, miracles. Uh, he such a simple little sentence. That's so profound. He said, reasoning does not happen to us. We do it. Now, let me say that again. Reasoning does not happen to us. We do it. But on Colton's view, reasoning happens to Colton, but Colton doesn't do it. I mean, that is to say that Colton is not actively engaged or in active control of how he reasons. He is not in control of the manner in which he experiences sensations of reasoning that was determined by antecedent conditions. Colton is not behind the steering wheel of reason, right? According to his view, He's a passive passenger tied up in the back seat, merely along for the ride at best. At worst, uh, Colton is a passive passenger tied up in the back seat, merely along for the ride, but he's also tripping on acid, <laughs> getting diluted. He's on drugs and he thinks he's driving, right? But he, he subjectively thinks he's in control when he's got zero control. And I don't know how many times I've had to say this, but if Ed is true, then the manner in which Colton finds himself experiencing sensations of reasoning is determined by a deity who determines all Christians to reason poorly and improperly, uh, necessitating false theological beliefs. And this leads us to what J.P. Moreland and I uh, refer to a deity of deception. So just uh, quickly, let me offer our uh, deity of deception argument which is based upon the idea that no mature human who studies God's word possesses a set of infallible theological beliefs. So let me read this here. Premise one, if Ed is true, then God determines all Christians to affirm some false theological beliefs. Two, if God determines all Christians to affirm some false theological beliefs, then God is deceptive or an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs, and his word, the Bible, cannot be trusted. Three, God is not deceptive or an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs, and his word can be trusted. Four, therefore, God does not determine all Christians to affirm some false theological beliefs. Five, therefore, Ed is false. 
Now, I'll get back to this argument later, but here's the point I want to focus on uh, right now. The manner in which Colton experiences sensations of reasoning happens to Colton on his view, but Colton does not do it as C.S. Lewis explained. Colton is not steering the ship of reason. And moreover, if Ed is true, then the manner in which Colton responds to reasons is also not up to Colton. God, who is relegated to an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs on Colton's view, determines and necessitates how, right, the manner in which he determines how Colton reasons. And just because your reason's responsive, that's not, that does not mean you're reasoning correctly. You can reason well or poorly, right? So uh, this deity of deception on Colton's view uh, determines and necessitates how Colton reasons well or poorly, and also determines exactly how Colton responds to his so-called reasons, right? That's what we're left with if so-called uh, reasons responsiveness is married to Ed, right? Don't get married to Ed. He's a bad guy, right? <laughs> I would say if your reasons responsiveness is, <laughs> is married to Ed, then I'd say big deal. That's not the kind of power to reason or respond to reasons that most people are going to find worth wanting. So yes, um, you know, passive thoughts uh, occurring one after another is active in a sense. I mean, there is activity, but in the more important sense, this activity is not up to Colton, uh, nor is it under his control. And that's the main point. And this is precisely because uh, the manner in which this activity occurs is not up to Colton, but it's not determined by Colton. It's determined and necessitated by an untrustworthy something or someone else. So, uh, you know, this kind of activity uh, that Colton is left with on his view is kind of akin to bowling. I mean, bowling balls interact with pins and physical action occurs, right? There's activity. But bowling balls and pins are all completely passive. They are at the mercy of the whims of external active agents. So thought experiment. Uh, suppose that God miraculously endows conscious awarenesses <laughs> into the bowling balls and the pins. But the balls and pins still have no active control over anything, including what they think about. They're just aware. That's all they've got, awareness. But if that's the case, then nothing would change. So who cares about conscious awareness if it can't be used to change anything? All it's good for is passively experiencing things, which, man, if you think about it, is a absolutely horrible thing for the damned on the Ed Calvinist view who have no power to avoid the experience of the, what I call the eternal Holocaust of hell, the eternal suffering and torture of hell, which is also determined by God. If Ed is true, it's just a really horrible view. Um, it seems to me, and I think would seem to most people, but anyway, I, I digress. That's another topic. Uh, let me get back to the conscious bowling balls. Um, so conscious bowling balls and, and conscious pins would simply be passively aware of what's happening without having any active control of or over what is happening. And this is exactly what is occurring with human, uh, with human interactions, if Ed is true. But again, and more importantly, J.P. Moreland and I are clear that there's an appropriate reducible paraphrase. I believe that's how I said it. An appropriate reducible paraphrase available to the determinist and one that the, the determinist ought to use for the sake of clarity and philosophical precision. Now, libertarians own some concepts that uh, determinists can't use. Like we can own or libertarians own concepts like uh, first mover, first thinker, uh, ultimate source. Uh, determinists can't use those. And that's because the buck stops with us at least on occasion, because there's a break in the antecedent causal chain. Now, based on the law of the excluded middle, one is either a first cause or a caused cause. Okay? One is either a first cause or a caused cause. One is either a first thinker or a passive cog. And if it's the latter, then all of a person's thoughts, beliefs, and actions are determined and necessitated by something or someone else. And if Ed is true, then humans are passive 
in the sense that they are entirely and exhaustively at the mercy of the whims of something or someone else. If Ed is true, what one thinks of and how the manner in which one thinks about it is entirely at the mercy of the whims of another agent who would be an active then and also an untrustworthy agent. And that point is so important. It should not be missed. It ought not be ignored. Uh, so let me reiterate. If Ed is true, uh, then Colton is passive in the sense that he's entirely and exhaustively at the mercy of the whims of some other guy, right? What Colton thinks of and how he thinks about it is entirely at the mercy of the whims of another guy, another agent, an active agent. In the case of Ed, this active agent who determines how Colton thinks and what he believes turns out to be a deity of deception, right? Now, this so-called reasoning happens to Colton as C.S. Lewis described. In that sense, Colton is completely passive in thought and action. Colton does not possess any so-called guidance control, um, or, or yeah, he, uh, Colton doesn't possess a control condition if something or someone else is in complete control of his condition. All right, let me say that again. Colton does not possess any so-called control condition if something or someone else is in complete control of his condition. And moreover, as I noted a few moments ago, uh, JP and I argue that all of these external something or someone else's are untrustworthy, even if they are untrustworthy for morally sufficient reasons, which you're going to hear quite often um, from the deterministic compatibilist. Uh, they'll say, oh, it's okay because God's got morally sufficient reasons. Well, that doesn't matter. Um, because that ultimately provides a defeater against the, deter the determinist theological beliefs, including those we're discussing right now. Um, so anyway, the, the thing one refers to is I, um, you know, the, the, the self, you know, the, when you say I think, all right, you're referring to yourself. So the thing one refers to is I is an active first thinker on my libertarian view. On the Ed view, however, uh, the eye begins to vanish. I wrote an article on my website called The Vanishing Eye uh, that I would point people to. That was several years, uh, several years ago I wrote that. But um, on that view, on this Ed view, all thoughts and beliefs are determined by another agent. All the eye is, on exhaustive divine determinism, is uh, something that is merely passively aware. Right, The eye the self does not actively drive the ship of reason, but is tied up and sitting in the back seat while another agent is behind the wheel. Right. And that's the key point, uh, the one that it seems to me uh, that Colton and many other determinists and compatibilists have not really seemed to grasp. Uh, or Yeah, to grasp. So uh, it often seems to me like we're talking past each other because I don't think a, a lot of them get this main point that I'm advancing. But let me add something here. Um, the paper I co-authored with Moreland, and, and I think I said this already, we're not done. We're doing more work together on this topic. Um, but that paper shows why determinism is self-defeating and also shows the importance of libertarian freedom uh, when it comes to rational deliberation. So if one is going to claim that they're not a free thinker in a libertarian sense, uh, then they must be prepared to give an account of the following questions. Uh, question one, what or who is determining the manner in which you think and ultimately what you believe, right? I mean, if you're going to say, hey, uh, nobody has libertarian freedom, I don't have libertarian freedom, that means that you're saying that you do not freely think in a libertarian sense. So you got to answer the question, okay, then what or who is determining the manner in which you think and ultimately what you believe? The next question is, is that thing or being a reliable and trustworthy source of truth. Why or why not? And then finally, are there defeaters that show that your view entails that that thing or being is an untrustworthy source of truth? So let me let me discuss all the problems. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm preaching here, but let me let me discuss all the problems if God is not the God of truth who desires all people to know the truth, as 1 Timothy 2, 4 says. But rather, if one's interpretation of Scripture entails that, that God is a God of mischief akin to Loki in the Avengers, right? So 
Uh, this is what is entailed by the non-biblical view of Ed. And I will say that Ed is a non-biblical view that opposes a clear in, uh, understanding of Scripture. So uh, here it is. If, if one says that their interpretation of Scripture is that God determines all things, then since all who study Scripture hold false theological beliefs until the day they die, it follows that God determines all Christians and everyone else to affirm false beliefs about ultimate reality. Uh, and that would be important metaphysical and theological beliefs. But if God determines all Christians and everyone else to hold and affirm false beliefs about ultimate reality, then God is an untrustworthy source of metaphysical and theological beliefs. And as soon as one even tacitly affirms that an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs inspired the book you think is true, now you have a self-defeating belief. It, it's irrational. You have good reason to not trust the Bible. And look, that's the last thing a Christian should want to do, right? So any other theological belief one holds from their view of creation in Genesis to how one is saved to one's assurance of salvation to eschatology, it's all now suspect and unjustified. So we have no reason to believe any of it if our view entails that God is a deity of deception or an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs. And that's what you get with Ed. And think about this. Um, one well-known Calvinist determinist compatibilist responded to my argument, uh, by the deity of deception argument, by saying, well, we've got historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, so I have reason to reject your deity of deception argument. But nothing is farther from the truth. In fact, that makes the problem so much worse. Right? If one's view is that God is a supernatural and omnipotent deity who determines all of his followers to affirm false beliefs about ultimate reality, then why should we care about who this deity brings back to life? Right? I mean, it seems that an omnipotent deity of deception or a god of mischief would choose to raise another deceiver from the dead instead of someone who is proclaiming the truth. Right? I mean, if, if Loki, the god of mischief, raised Hitler from the dead, should we all become Nazis? Well, of course not. You need a maximally great being. You need a god of truth raising Jesus from the dead to reach the conclusion that Christianity is true and that we should all become Christians. Now, ultimately, this view that Colton and his fellow deterministic Calvinist compatibilists are advancing is not only anti-biblical, it destroys the reliability of the Bible. It's a, it's a double dose of anti-biblicality, right? It, it opposes Scripture and then destroys Scripture. So how can this be called Christianity if the view actually destroys Scripture? Now, now hear me. I am not claiming that this necessarily follows from five-point Calvinism. You can keep your five points if you want to. I don't think you should. I'm not saying that Calvinists, five-point Calvinists cannot be called Christians. I am arguing, however, that the Calvinist who claims that God determines all things exhaustively not only opposes Scripture, but that view destroys the reliability of Scripture. So Christ followers must reject this Ed view. However, if you think that Ed is synonymous with Calvinism, as many Calvinist scholars do, then you got to drop Calvinism. All right, I've said a whole bunch. I'll let you guys do some talking. Right on. Josh, what do you what are your thoughts on it? I'm gonna reserve some of my comments uh for a little bit later and then so we can kind of, you know, power through these questions. But Josh, if you've got anything that you would like to add, uh feel free and then we'll go to Andrew. Um I, I, I'll keep it short too, because we're 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 pressing on time and I know there's a lot of questions to get to, so I don't want to like drag on, but what you were saying in the beginning about the problem of awareness. Uh, and agency and things like that. A term that I've come to be very comfortable with using is experiential agency. That's what you're afforded in the deterministic worldview is an experiential yep. form of agency, and not an it. active, rational, causing uh, causal form of mm -hmm. agency. Um, and so I think that um, if if there's anything that falls under merely the level of your experiences, like you said, being tied up in the back seat, you're not in the driver's seat, but you are present. You're experiencing 
things as they happen. And you're experiencing at best the illusion of being the source of your decisions. And because of that awareness, the awareness seems to be sufficient to um, dupe your senses uh, and your rationality or whatever it is you're experiencing as rationality. Um, and, and there was an analogy that I used in the last episode that just quickly I, 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 I can repeat just because it, I think that it actually encapsulate this pretty well because I was using exactly the same kind of, uh, of mechanisms that were being described when Colton was describing compatibilism. Let's say you have a heat seeking missile. Now the missile has a want or an internal desire to follow heat signatures, right? And and to have the internal mechanism and it ensures that that want uh, is going to be present and that it's going to pursue, right? And even if you gave this thing a semblance of artificial intelligence so much that it could be aware of its desire to seek heat, right? And it actually has reasons responsiveness, which is that internal mechanism that ensures that it will seek out that desire. You still would never consider a missile to be morally responsible. What it is, is in fact, what Colton actually said in the last episode is a uh, an instrumental source. Uh, and an instrumental source, as far as I can understand, which he he gave me kudos for listening carefully and being able to repackage to him exactly what his analogy entailed. I don't think that even if you combine the things that compatibilism seems to think it can afford, if you combine those things and you take it outside of uh, the the human platform of biology and you put it on anything else, it does not amount to anything like uh, free moral agency. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think just to echo what you basically said in a much more shorter version, we're not heat seeking missiles. <laughs> That's not that doesn't amount to blameworthiness or praiseworthiness. Instrumental causes are not moral agency. Hmm. Or epistemic agency. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, because the missile can't even if the missile had a, an awareness uh, of, of its desire and had reasons to pursue, it still wouldn't have the ability to reason toward whether or not that was the thing it wanted to pursue it would yeah, simply again, have the want and the reason yeah if if exhaustive divine determinism is true what you're aware of is not determined by you the manner in which you think ultimately leading to your so-called choice is not up to you it's determined by another guy but i here so here's the thing all these quotes that i'm pulling from is from the first the part one that we did with Colton called Calvinism compatibilism continued. There's two parts. So I would recommend everyone go watch. Well, actually I would recommend everyone go watch the entire playlist, the 20 hours now that we have on this subject, but the quotes that I'm specifically pulling from are from Calvinism compatibilism continued part one. And so with that being said in that video, between the 20 minute and 35 minute timestamp, Colton objects multiple times that you, Tim, have not done a proper internal critique. Not only has Colton said this, Tyler Vela has made the same accusations. And so, namely because you won't interact with premises and definitions that Colton or Tyler or other uh, compatibilists would accept. And so my question, it's kind of a two-part question. What is your response to this first and foremost? And if... It, sorry, are there other ways? So what is your response to that? Are there other ways to argue other than doing an internal critique? If so, what are they? And if not, could you give us an example of a proper internal critique? So with all due respect to Colton and even Tyler, I, I don't care what Colton and Tyler subjectively accept. I think I've said that before, but on Colton's view, he is not in control of what he accepts or rejects, right? That is up to another guy, God, a deity of deception, right? <laughs> so, I mean, let that sink in. Uh, on Colton's view, he is not in any active control of what he accepts or rejects. That's up to a deity of deception. On my view, Colton's mind seems to have been made up by him. Uh, it's been hardened by him. Uh, Colton's hardened his own heart or hardened his own mind here in a sense. I believe that humans 
can harden our own hearts and minds by way of non-careful thinking, especially over the course of time, right? So, so what do I, what do I care about? I care about what those who have open minds are willing to accept. And more importantly, I care about what is logically entailed by a view, even if the adherent of said view refuses to accept what is logically entailed by their own view. That is, that's the primary uh, point that I'm concerned with here. I care about what is logically entailed by a view, even if the adherent of that view does not uh, realize it. Okay. So uh, JP and I, we offer arguments that actually get inside the shoes of the guy who affirms the concept of exhaustive divine determinism. So we start with what is true according to the Ed view, and we make our case from there. So let me let me give another uh, a slightly altered version of the one I offered earlier. Just a second, let me <clears throat> get this up. Okay, premise one: If God determines all things about humanity, then God determines all Christians to have some false theological intuitions and to hold some false theological beliefs. Two: If God determines all Christians to have some false theological intuitions and to hold some false theological beliefs, then God is an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs. Three, if God is an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs, then there is reason to doubt God's inspired word. Four, there is never reason to doubt God's inspired word. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, thank you. <laughs> amen. <laughs> Five, Therefore, God is not an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs. Six, therefore, God does not determine all Christians to have some false theological intuitions and to hold some false theological beliefs. And finally, seven, uh, therefore, God does not determine all things about humanity. And thus, Ed is false. Exhaustive divine determinism is false. God does not determine and necessitate all Things So the premises leading to the deductive conclusions are extremely strong. And if Colton says, yeah, but I've got a different intuition, then that makes the point of the argument. Colton's subjective intuition cannot be trusted if it's determined by a deity of deception or an untrustworthy source who determines all Christians, including Colton himself, to have false intuitions regarding ultimate reality uh, and theological matters. All he's left with now is question begging or, you know, begging the question. That's all you've got at this point, reasoning in a circle. And I've explained this on numerous occasions, but moreover, as I've recently noted, if one replaces the word God with demon or another agent, one would have no problem affirming the so-called controversial premise of this argument. So it seems to be special pleading not to do it here just because we're discussing a deity. And as I, as I've said in the past, um, I've said this on my website and YouTube uh, channel, I think I, I said, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. And if it's good for a demon, it's good for a deity. But ultimately, I'm not, I'm not concerned with what Colton or any other compatibilist subjectively thinks here. I'm concerned with what is logically entailed by a certain position. And those who disagree with me then possess the burden of, of showing exactly why my conclusions are not entailed. My goal is to show people who do not yet have a dog in the fight, uh, show people whose minds are not already made up or hardened, uh, what is wrong with this low view of God. And, and also, it's not just a low view of God, it's also a low view of man. And heck, it's also a, a low view of scripture. It's about a low view of everything. Um, but this is what is logically entailed by Colton's view of exhaustive divine determinism. So bottom line, this argument exposes the fact that belief that God's inspired word is trustworthy is incompatible with exhaustive divine determinism. Let me say that again. This argument exposes the fact that the belief that God's inspired word is trustworthy is incompatible with exhaustive divine determinism. So in that vital sense, JP and I have demonstrated that compatibilism is false. And this follows even if a compatibilist subjectively does not accept it. Now, they, they might want to argue that something else is compatible with determinism. Fine. Make your case. 
But J.P. Moreland and I have shown that the belief that God's inspired word is trustworthy is incompatible with determinism or exhaustive divine determinism. And if they respond by saying, well, I just don't have that intuition or I don't accept your premise, that response is impotent. It doesn't do anything. In our paper, J.P. and I quote epistemologist uh, uh, Jim Slagle, yeah. who notes that if God or anything else determines all things, including the manner in which you think, then God determines what propositions and premises uh, we, note the scare quotes there, um, God determines what premises we accept or reject. That acceptance or rejection is not up to us, it's up to somebody else, namely God, a deity of deception. So Slagle notes that it's hard to call something my belief if the propositions leading to it were not accepted by me, but be, but determined by another agent. So anyway, if a deity of deception determines Colton to reject a premise of an argument, now the rejection of the premise of the argument is unjustified. So let me say that again. This view of Ed is self-defeating. It's irrational. It's also unbiblical. It not only opposes scripture, it destroys scripture. So look, I've devoted my life to defending God's word. I am a Christian apologist. Right? I defend the reliability of scripture, and thus I will fight against views that attack scripture, even if it's inadvertently coming from fellow Christians who are still confused on this topic. So uh, yeah, because I am, I am a defender of scripture, I cannot I will definitely oppose any view, even if it's from Christians, if their view winds up uh, dropping a bomb on Scripture and Christianity itself. Okay, given that compatibilists believe that the agent is actually choosing, and so I think, I really think Colton brought this out not, not only in the first video, but in the part two, that he truly sees himself as an interim instrumental source, his words, um, as, as participating, uh, even though that God determines these things, right. But he's actually participating, uh, in that, which God has determined. And so the question is given that compatibilists believe that the agent is actually choosing or doing what it is that God determined, what's the issue with them saying, I chose this, or I did that. When in reality, the agent is actually interacting and participating in what God has determined they would. Just because God determined them to think and do doesn't necessarily entail that God is thinking or acting for them, or they somehow aren't actually experiencing or participating in the thoughts and actions God determined them to do. Is that right? So first of all, I, I I hope we have time to get back to question four because I think it was important. But okay, um, we will. To answer, <clears throat> but to answer this, uh, it all boils down to active agency versus passive awareness, yeah. and and uh, really to miss this vital point is to invalidate one from this particular debate. You've got to get this if you're going to debate this, and I don't think many determinists have gotten this. Now Moreland and I are pointing out the vital differences between what is objectively true at least if Ed is true, what would be objectively true, and what one subjectively experiences. Now, our friend Michael Preciado, for example, who Colton often references, has offered um, what he refers to as the subjectivist condition for dessert responsibility and says that we have to subjectively see ourselves as the actual source and see ourselves as the apt candidate for praise or blame or for, for praise of blame. Um, no, pray, yeah, praise. Yeah, you get the idea. But, but look, I contend that we should not subjectively see ourselves as the actual source if we're not the actual source. That's kind of crazy, right? That, that would be to, to subjectively believe a falsehood about objective reality. And, and so, indeed, if Ed is true, we ought to see ourselves as caused causes or passive cogs. So it's utterly absurd to say an omnipotent God determined and necessitated you to believe X, but you really should have believed otherwise. I mean, do you see the absurdity there? Now, as I said in my debate with James White, again, almost a year ago to the day, tomorrow, uh, White had no response 
to what I said. I, I said, no possible world exists where God determined me to do X, but I really should have done other than X because yeah. that, that doesn't make any sense. Now, it, well, so if a deity of deception determines a person to believe a falsehood, then talk of what a passive but conscious cog ought to believe goes down the drain, right? And moreover, uh, if we are not the actual source, then we should not be seen as the apt candidate for praise or blame, right? So I'll call that the objectivist condition or the objective truth condition. Now, side note, I mentioned this before, but I want to hammer this home. Much of this is based upon the word agent. What do determinists mean by the word agent, right? It's something radically different than what libertarians mean by the word agent. So we must make determinists define exactly what they mean by that term. So I, I quickly noted it earlier, but let me uh, offer some different ways to understand agency. So here's the first one. An agent is an active driver behind the steering wheel and driving the ship of reason, right? That is to say, another agent is not driving the driver, right? The, the driver is free in a libertarian sense and free to steer the ship of reason. So that means the agent, while thinking things through, as it were, uh, can swerve to the left or turn to the right. The agent can tap on the brakes or step on the gas. Uh, the, if the agent chooses, the agent can hit the emergency brake and do a 180 and go the other direction and then turn on the brights just to make sure he didn't miss something previously while thinking things through in the past. An agent, an agent that's driving uh, this ship of reason, uh, if, if he chooses, he can keep driving full speed ahead and then turn up the radio to 11, right? These are all things yeah. that are determined by and up to the driver right? The agent who is driving the ship of reason. So that's a libertarian free thinker. That's a libertarian free agent. Um, so that's the first way to consider a, a thinking agent. Now, uh, we also have two other options to consider. Now, this is what an agent is if determinism is true. An agent is a passive passenger tied up, gagged, sitting in the back seat, merely along for the ride. Now, this agent experiences, as we were talking about earlier, this agent experiences passive sensations of turning to the left, feelings of acceleration and the quality of slowing down. But the, this so-called agent is not an act of control of any of it. Right? This ersatz agent is at the mercy of the whims of the source agent behind the wheel. Yeah. Okay? Now, that's what you're left with on determinism. Now, there's a third option that I think aptly describes the compatibilist view. So here's the third, uh, the third option here. An agent is a drugged and diluted passive passenger tied up, gagged, and sitting in the back seat who subjectively and incorrectly believes that he or she is driving. That's right? called LSD. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this ersatz agent is at the mercy of the whims of the real agent behind the wheel but is deluded on drugs and believes he is actually steering the manner in which he thinks and reasons, but nothing is further from the truth. Now, option three describes the determinist who affirms that something or someone else necessitates all things, including the entirety of his mental actions, but who still uh, claims to have so-called guidance control, right? The first option entails the libertarian freedom to think, reason, and deliberate. Now, options two and three are entailed by determinism. Now, uh, Tyler, yes, you and I uh, kind of read through this book together. Fantastic yes. book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the first edition, and it was I've done a lot of work based on that. But you were sending me some quotes from the second edition. I was like, okay, I got to get that one too. And wow, the second edition is much better than the first. Um, but in that book... Uh, you and I discussed um, what, you know, so Kevin Tempe wrote that book uh, and he noted that Eleanor Stump uh, was talking about something pretty important here and referenced characters in Dostoevsky's novel, The Possessed. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably going to mispronounce some names here, but here's what Eleanor Stump said, quote, even if it were 
sorry, even if it were coherent to suppose that one agent, say Berkovensky, could directly produce some reasoning in the mind of another, such as Stavrogin, uh, that reasoning would not be Stavrogin's, but rather Berkovensky's, or at any rate, a product of Berkovensky's reasoning. If Berkovensky continuously produced thoughts in Stavrogin, then Stavrogin would have ceased to be a person and would instead be something like Verkovensky's puppet. An agent's second-order volitions cannot be produced by someone else, mm. end quote. Now, Stump continues and says, quote, The essence of freedom is that the agent's own mental faculties, her intellect and will, are the ultimate sources of any free act and not something outside the agent. A free action, mental or bodily, cannot be caused by something external to the agent, end quote. But you see, that's exactly what's happening if Colton's view of exhaustive divine determinism is true. Moreover, not only is humanity not epistemically responsible for what we refer to as rational inference, if the something else that determines the entirety of our mental activity can be shown to be non-rational or untrustworthy, right? this is going to get us back to C.S. Lewis's argument from reason, then humanity cannot ration, rationally affirm that we have rationally inferred better or true beliefs over false ones, and that gets us to the free-thinking argument, um, which can be found in my book and also in the... Uh, article that I just co-authored with J.P. Moreland, where we made it even stronger. Yeah. Um, so this is the case of non-rational antecedent conditions fully explain the entirety of human mental activity, or if an untrustworthy supernatural agent, including a deity with good reasons, even with morally sufficient reasons, determines all of our thoughts and beliefs. It's just, it's just that simple. This is, and I want all of our listeners, not right now, but after we after we get done here to go listen to part one. And this is just my personal opinion on this, uh, but I want to know what you guys think. And so at the one hour, five minute and 50 second mark of Calvinism, compatibilism, continued part one to the one hour and six minute and 16 second mark. My question is, do you guys think Colton tripped up over his language here? Or did he actually mean what he said, specifically in regard to, quote, we have control of our actions to me or in quote to me? And maybe I'm just thinking of different connotations for what this sentence could mean. But this is like saying I determine how I do things. And so the what the to give it just a background of what we were talking about, Colton had made the argument that guidance control doesn't say that we can choose to do A or B, but rather if God has determined us to do A, we have choice in the matter of how we do A. And Colton, if you're listening, and if I've messed that up, that but I think that's what you said, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but please feel free to correct me. Um, but but given our private conversations and given the conversations uh, that we've had on air, um, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm representing you accurately there. But in regards to the we have control of how we do A, not necessarily we can do A or B, that seems to eliminate theological determinism. Because again, the concept of theological determinism is that God determines all things. And Tim, I can't stress this enough, and I'm glad, I am glad for reasons just like this, that <laughs> you talk about Ed. And Calvinists get mad at you all the time. I've seen it multiple times. Well, exhaustive divine determinism just entails determinism. But then they say things like this. We have right. control over our actions. No, mm -hmm. you don't. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> not how you do them, not A or B, because even it's just stop and think about this just for a second. If you have 
control over how you do things, then you're ch still choosing from available options at that point. You can choose A or B <laughs> still at that point. And it's just like on a more zoomed in level is how Josh and I uh, have kind of talked about that. But Tim, what, what are your thoughts there? Um, and then we'll just go around Josh, if you want to comment and then Andrew after Josh. Yeah, I guess what, uh, you know, I didn't watch that, your interview with, uh, Colton, uh, on that one, uh, I've seen some of his videos in the past and a little bit of what he's done with you, but I haven't seen all this. So, yeah. you know, when, so you said that he said we have control of our actions. And so I, what comes to mind is, uh, intentionality you know so regarding colton's use of of right let's, let's talk about that so philosophers refer uh to a person's ofness as intentionality right uh, the chair is not of the carpet or the floor uh the the table is not about the ceiling um or, but humans have this ofness uh, I think animals do too, to an extent. I also think the animals have souls and things like that. In fact, I just uh, wrote an article on my website um, called All Dogs Go to Heaven. Yeah, and, I like that. Uh, I actually made an argument, um, even supported by scripture, uh, that uh, animals uh, do go to heaven. But um, anyway, that's a topic for another um, uh, video. But uh, re philosophers refer to uh, the fact that we can be of something or about something as intentionality. So this includes how we think of things and what we believe about things. So one is not in control of what one believes if something or someone else determines how one thinks or the manner in which one thinks, which ultimately leads to said belief uh or any physical actions that follow from said belief, right? So think about a powerful wizard um, that, that uses this magic to take control. So the powerful and magical wizard who determines Colton to believe X is in control of Colton believing X. Now, he, uh, Colton might respond and say, well, that's manipulation. That's not God-given, Okay. But that misses the point. And I can rephrase it this way. I can say the deity of deception, an untrustworthy source of beliefs who determines Colton to believe X, is in control of Colton believing X. So here's the point. Uh, Colton's use of the word control is not a sense of control worth wanting or having. If Colton's view is true, then Colton has the same kind of control that the bowling ball possesses that I talked about earlier, the conscious bowling ball. But if another agent determines what Colton thinks of and how Colton thinks about it, then Colton does not possess a control of his mental actions. He's merely aware. Right? He experiences awareness of what something or someone else is determining. But if Colton does not possess control of his mental actions, then Colton is not in any kind of, uh, he doesn't have any kind of relevant control of his body movements that would follow from these mental actions. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about it, uh, that's seriously how I would describe my dog, but not humans created in the image of God. Again, I say that Colton's Ed view entails a, a, not just a low view of God, but a low view of man, right? If Ed Calvinism is true, it's a low view of God and a low view of man, and it destroys scripture. <laughs> so look, if one is not epistemically responsible, uh, then one is not body movement responsible either. And in my paper with JP, we showed that if Ed is true, you're not epistemically responsible. So it's all about free thinking. And that's exactly why I dubbed my organization Free Thinking Ministries. Humans are the kinds of supernatural beings created in the likeness of God. And we possess the power to take bad thinking captive, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, right? And that's the epitome of active and careful thinking, libertarian free thinking. And our free thinking often determines then our body movements, at least at least the ones that we're responsible for. Thus, we are responsible in a dessert sense for important thoughts and our body movements that follow from those important thoughts. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, you know, just to add real quick, and then Josh and Andrew, I'll give it to you guys. 
uh, listening to St. John of Damascus, Tim, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, but uh, it sounds like the free thinking argument is you, you can you can word that different ways. Not the argument itself, but the term free thinking, right? That's mm-hmm. deliberation, right? Yeah. You mm-hmm. can choose from ava- among available options. You can choose to reason logically. You can choose to reason rationally or irrationally or illogically. But but the point I'm trying to make here is that St. John of Damascus is talking about, and I think it's in book two um, uh, of, his, of his work, that if... Deter or, or deliberation is basically the concept of deliberation, not deliberating itself, but the concept of deliberation, quote, is foolish if God predetermines, and he uses that word, not predestines, but predetermines uh, all things, everything. And not only is he arguing against, because he specifically mentions that, like, the God's uh, some people believe that gods determine things. Some people believe that nature determines things, you know, in his, even in his day, in the six, seven hundreds. Uh, but then he also brings up the point that some Christian uh, sects, uh, not Christians, I think that he's arguing uh, against non-Christians here, but he labels them under the category of Christian. And you can't see me, but I'm giving the scare quotes there. But the point is, he's talking about theological determinism in that Yahweh God determines all things, and he calls deliberation the concept of foolishness if God determines all things, because determination or, or, or deliberation doesn't exist at that point. Uh, mm-hmm. The illusion of deliberation, maybe, but deliberation itself, you are only doing um, what God has determined you to do at that point. And yeah. so, anyway, Josh, uh, Andrew? Um, I, the... the <clears throat> the thing that this brings to my, especially with your last comment there, Tyler, is this, yeah. what this brings to mind is, is uh, the way that Colton was insisting that um, we can say that we choose, we can say that um, <clears throat> alternate possibilities exist, yet I don't have access to them. And we're insisting, no, without access to them, their existence is basically meaningless, right? Like the idea that there are alternate possibilities, but you don't have access to any of them means that they're not alternate or possibility. Right. In in, in my understanding, the word possibility connotes with it possible. And if you don't have access to alternate <laughs> possibilities, then they aren't possible. Yeah. Except in a very highly technical, non-useful way. Yeah. Uh, they'll say, well, it's possible if God, you know, God could have determined you to do other, or it's possible for you to do otherwise if God would have determined you to right. do otherwise. Well, big deal. Of course, uh, God can, <laughs> an omnipotent God can <laughs> determine all kinds of things, but that doesn't give you access uh, to doing otherwise if it's up to God to do otherwise. So it's just, I, I think that's one of the silliest and most absurd responses. Um from the the other from my friends on the other side of the aisle there <laughs> andrew yeah going back to the we're in control yeah. the only way we can observe that is to the degree that we're acting in time so i think james white it, it recalls me to a, a statement he made during your debate uh dr stratton that he cannot look on the other side of the decree and know what god has set in his place but that just that proves the rule of, of what is being argued is, okay, we're not talking about what you and I can tangentially experience here in, in time. Yes, we're acting off um, self-determination and um, we're being predisposed to things that are forming our inclinations that develop into our actions. But the Calvinist has to posit, he has to concede that all these things No matter how much they want to bolster that we have some kind of creaturely liberty or some kind of will, it will never escape the fact that it is causally determined in their view. So to bring back the missile analogy, let's let's say it's a heat seeking missile and you see it in midair and it's really like you go, oh, man, that missile's really seeking heat. Well, yeah, that's because that's what it was made to do and it can't do anything other than that. 
and mm-hmm. that's the exact same thing that that our Calvinist uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, that's the same thing that they're um, tying themselves in a knot on, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good point. So, for those um, listening, like I said, we can't play the clip. So this is at the fifty-one twenty-three uh, timestamp. And so going back, Dr. Stratton, to what you had said in our previous episodes about Colton missing the point of yours and Dr. Moreland's paper, could you elaborate a bit more on what you meant by how Colton missed the point of the paper? Also, does it have anything to do with Colton, quote, smuggling in libertarian vocab words, end quote? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, it seems to me that Colton has missed some of the most important points of the free thinking argument. And the related arguments that I've advanced uh, with JP, um, but one of the primary points, and I, you know, I, let me say this: I should know that it's. Fine. I've had some uh, compatibilists and Calvinists and determinists seem to imply that they know the argument better than I do, or at least what my goals are here. And look, I think I should know the goals of the argument uh, better than anyone else, maybe, uh, maybe besides JP Moreland, but. Uh, one of the primary points that's made in the defense of the free thinking argument is that the, the, the source of a metaphysical or theological belief, if that source of our metaphysical and theological belief is untrustworthy, then that trustworthiness transfers to the belief itself. And I've referred to this on my website as the transfer of untrustworthiness, the transfer of untrustworthiness principle. Now, we've also got the transfer of trust principle. And I noted earlier, I think, that if God is a maximally great being and a God of truth, then if that's the case, if God's a maximally great being, God of truth, then if God raises Jesus from the dead, then we seem to have a divine stamp of approval on everything that Jesus said, taught, and exemplified. And if God is a maximally great being and the resurrection is historical, I affirm both of those propositions then we have reason to believe that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. We have reason to trust what was written by Jesus's handpicked apostles in the New Testament. We have reason to believe that Jesus is the only way, John 14, 6. We have reason to have assurance of salvation. And then we have reason to even trust the Old Testament since Jesus gave his stamp of approval upon it. So look, if if we're going to say a deity of deception raised Jesus from the dead, we got problems. But if we say, no, God is a God of truth and a maximally great being, and that maximally great being raised Jesus from the dead, now we that that transfer of trust um, applies to all of our theological beliefs that we get from Scripture. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, and speaking of Scripture, Numbers 23, 19, uh, God is not a man that he should lie, right? And if God does not lie, then God is not a deity of deception. God is a maximally great being and a God of truth. And and this all follows from the transfer of trust principle, but there's also a transfer of untrustworthiness principle. And it's like the boy who cried wolf, right? The boy and the boy who cried wolf had demonstrated that he was untrustworthy. So even if he was telling the truth at a later point in time, there was reason to doubt the boy's claims. And so a defeater is raised against the boy's claims because he had already demonstrated himself to be a liar. On Ed Calvinism, God determines all Christians and every other human to affirm false beliefs about ultimate reality, metaphysical and theological beliefs. Ed Calvinism relegates a maximally great being into a God who cried wolf (laughs) and a deity who is untrustworthy. Now, Alvin Plantinga uh, once made a great point referencing um, uh, Thomas Reed. And he said, if you want to know whether or not a man tells the truth, the right way to proceed is not to ask him. So if you have reason to suspect a certain man is a liar, then why should you believe this individual when he tells you that he's not a liar? Right? It's not, a, it's not justified. Right? This is why mil- millions of Marvel fans Uh, found the following uh, interaction quite humorous in the Loki series. So Loki is having a conversation with uh, Owen Wilson's character, Mobius. And 
and Loki, who's known as the god of mischief, you know, he and this god, little G, who deceives uh everybody all the time, it seems <laughs> right. So Loki is trying to convince Mobius to uh to trust him, and, and and Loki says, You can trust me. And Mobius says, Loki, I've studied almost every moment of your entire life. You've literally stabbed people in the back like 50 times. And Loki's response is, well, I'll never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because everyone <laughs> sees the absurdity in that response, including little kids who are watching it. But yeah. in the same way, if we have reason to suspect that the manner in which we experience thought and reason is determined by a deity of deception or an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs, why assume these specific thoughts and reasons, which are already suspected of being unreliable, are reliable? When addressing this defeater. So to avoid this problem, the entirety of our mental lives cannot be determined by an untrustworthy source. We've got to be free from untrustworthy deterministic antecedent conditions. We've got to be free to think, what I refer to as libertarian free thinking. And in our paper, J.P. Moreland and I discuss uh, that this makes the most sense. We give four options at the end in our conclusion. And uh, and we discuss um, that really there's only one way to do this. And, and what makes the most sense of this libertarian free thinking is if God exists and created humanity with what seems to be a supernatural power, right? Not being determined by the laws and events of nature, uh, seeming like, like everything else in the universe. But when, when we're thinking things through and deliberating about the inference to the best explanation, right? That's got to be us driving that ship. And that only makes sense if God created us in his image and likeness and gave us this power to do it. Um, now, I also show the problem with abductive reasoning of something or someone else deterministically prevents the one experiencing these sensations of deliberatings from actually accessing better and true beliefs, which is what you get if Ed is true, right? Uh, God would prevent you, deterministically prevent you from accessing truth when you're trying to figure out what is true, at least when you're wrong. So, and, and since everybody's wrong, God does this to everybody on occasion, no, but especially uh, in, even on the theological matters, right? So it's hard to refer to a person as a rational agent if something or someone else determines the manner in which they think and how they think about things and ultimately deterministically prevents them, this so-called agent from accessing truth. How is that a rational agent? If someone else deterministically prevents you, you know, deterministically uh, necessitates the way you think. And, and, and as Paul Helm said, uh, every twist and turn of your thinking is under the control of God on his view. Um, but, and, then, and then God deterministically prevents you from getting the truth on a theological matter. How can we refer to you if you're being determined in that manner as a rational agent, don't tell me that's a rational agent. So yes, though, to, to Colton's uh, or to your question, Colton, as well as the vast majority of determinists, or, you know, it seems to me to be that way. I do think they continually steal from libertarian language and they should not do this when an appropriate reducible paraphrase, as Moreland says, is available for them to use and one that one that I can't use as a libertarian, right? I don't have access to that. So use the terms that I don't have access to. And I'm going to try to use the terms that you don't have access to. So indeed, this reducible paraphrase provides clarification and philosophical precision. So let's use the different languages uh, that correspond to these opposing views so we don't talk past each other and we don't confuse the audience trying to make sense of this. Um, so look, unless, unless a determinist wants to employ a rhetorical mirage, as JP and I discuss in our paper, um, if they want to employ a rhetorical mirage to deceive those new to the discussion, we ought to be as clear as possible. Let's strive for philosophical precision and not use terms uh, that um, other, the other has access to. R use the terms that I don't have access to to describe your view. So both John Martin Fisher in in his works and in, in his book that he wrote with uh, 
Revisa, and Colton on our podcast have stated that one primary reason they are compatibilist is because of what Tempe calls the, quote, held hostage objection. So the held hostage objection states that if determinism were to be scientifically proven in some fashion, then the compatibilist wouldn't have to alter their views of moral responsibility or human freedom, whereas the incompatibilist would for either to be inconsistent or or either be inconsistent in their beliefs. So in other words, since the compa- the incompatibilist, excuse me, holds that the truth of determinism and human freedom and moral responsibility are incompatible, if determinism were scientifically proven, they would either have to a affirm human freedom, moral responsibility, therefore granting compatibilism, B, deny human freedom and moral responsibility, granting incompatibilism, or B, or C, excuse me, be inconsistent. So Fisher explains this, quote, one of my main motivations for being a compatibilist is that I don't want our personhood and our moral accountability, as it were, to hang on a thread or to be held hostage to the possible scientific discovery that determinism is in fact true end quote so tim what do you think about the held hostage objection and does it play a significant role in this debate Uh, no uh, the held hostage objection does not play a significant role in the debate in fact in my opinion it's an absurd reason to be in a to be a compatibilist (laughs) so that's what i think about the hho uh, the the this hostage crisis um so that's all i got to say about that just kidding. I have a lot to say about <laughs> it. So, so hang on tight. Yeah. Um, I really have three points in response to this. Uh, so point number one, science is the wrong tool for the job, right? So the trilemma that we're offered here is a false one. There's another option at our disposal, and that's simply to reject the so-called science that says determinism is true. One of the first things I learned at Biola University uh, when I was there um, under JP is what, what can science do and what can science not do? And this science, science is the wrong tool for the job on a lot, you know, our, our culture is vastly, you know, is really confused and they think that science can answer all kinds of questions when the scientist is impotent to do that. So the primary reason to reject the supposed scientific discoveries, because science is the wrong tool for a metaphysical job. And this is like asking the following questions. By the way, there are such things as stupid. Well, let's not call them stupid. Let's call them unintelligent and uninformed questions. So uh, somebody (laughs) says, well, well, what if, what if science someday proves that abstract objects don't exist? Or what if somebody says, well, what if science someday proves that angelic beings don't exist? Or what if science someday proves that God doesn't exist? So why are these unintelligent questions? Because these are metaphysical questions that are outside of the scope of scientists. Uh, You might as well ask a plumber what he thinks about these metaphysical issues. Nothing against plumbers, right? I mean, but, but science is the study of nature, the physical universe, and thus a scientist is one who studies nature and the physical universe. Now, abstract objects, if they exist or not, angelic beings, if they exist or not, souls created in the image of God, if they exist or not, and even God himself, if he exists or not, are not natural or physical kinds of things. Thus, these questions are outside of the field of the natural sciences. So we need metaphysics to discover the truth of these important questions. So just as just as a plumber can't discover the answer to these questions while working on your toilet or on the pipes under your sink, a scientist is utterly impotent to tell us anything about these metaphysical questions while they're in the lab. One is not going to find abstract objects if they exist or not in a Petri dish, or find demons if they exist or not in the flames of a Bunsen burner. Similarly, a scientist is impotent to prove determinism is true, exhaustive determinism, right? Science is the wrong tool for that job. So if we read the headline, uh, scientists prove determinism in the New York Times tomorrow morning, uh, we would be justified in laughing at this fake news. 
uh, just as much as we are justified today in laughing at those who claim that chat GPT is a rational agent, right? They just don't understand what they're talking about. Um, uh, they haven't done metaphysics, right? So imagine uh, one of the most well-known doctors in the world, um, Dr. Anthony Fauci, all right? Rem imagine, <laughs> imagine that he gets on CNN tomorrow and he says, I'm Dr. Anthony Fauci and I am the science. I mean, he actually said that, that he is the science, right? So, so he, he then says, let me tell you, as the science, I can speak with authority and declare that determinism is true. No one has ever possessed libertarian freedom and no one ever will freely think in a libertarian sense. I am the science. All right. <laughs> I <laughs> swear I'm going to make that an MP3 like Dude. sound effect. <laughs> I was going to say, I that needs to be my ringtone now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look. Oh, that was good. So, if you see Dr. Anthony Fauci, <laughs> Dr. Jill Biden, or any other doctor telling you that the science has <laughs> proven that determinism is true and that no one has ever possessed libertarian freedom or no, no one ever will possess libertarian freedom, you are justified in rejecting their ignorant claims because science is the wrong tool for that metaphysical job. Yeah. Metaphysics is the proper tool for this job. Now, I just got to say, uh, JP actually thinks that uh, even there, he, he doesn't even think that there's quantum indeterminacy. But once you grant the soul, which nobody argues for better than he does, um, in the, really in the world, I, I believe, uh, the soul is not something that science could detect. Right. It's it's just the wrong science is the wrong tool for the job. If, if the soul is uh, an immaterial aspect of uh, human existence, science can't detect it. Um, so uh, so JP doesn't even think we, we he, JP, I think, would say, look, even if science does say, hey, quantum indeterminacy, uh, we were wrong about that. The quantum realm is completely determined because, uh, you know, if that were to happen, JP would say, doesn't matter uh, that you can't prove that we don't have libertarian freedom because it's a metaphysical issue. Um, so this brings us to the next point that the, uh, science is the wrong tool for the job. What's the right tool? Point two, uh, metaphysics is the right tool. So consider an extremely powerful metaphysical argument I've advanced in the literature with the help of J.P. Moreland, the free thinking argument against naturalism. Premise one, if robust naturalism is true, God or things like God do not exist. Two, if God or things like God do not exist, then humanity does not freely think in the libertarian sense. Three, if humanity does not freely think in the libertarian sense, then humanity is never epistemically responsible. Four, humanity is occasionally epistemically responsible. Five, therefore, humanity freely thinks in the libertarian sense. Six, therefore, God or things like God exist. Seven, therefore, robust naturalism is false. Uh, those are three deductive conclusions. Here's an abductive conclusion. Eight, the best explanation of God, things like God, and the libertarian freedom of humanity, which allows epistemic responsibility, is the biblical account of reality. So that's a metaphysical argument, which uh, even appeals to epistemology to inform us about metaphysics. Now, with metaphysics in mind, this version of the free thinking argument, which is part of the larger family of the arguments from reason, uh, really going back to C.S. Lewis, really goes back uh, to the early uh, 20th century, um, Arthur, Sir, uh, the British Prime Minister Arthur Balfour, I think his name was. But you can find other people kind of thinking these things through for uh, you know uh, a couple thousand years. Um, but anyway, this free thinking argument that JP and I have now advanced provides metaphysical and deductive evidence that a scientist who claims all things about humanity are determined would not know what he's talking about. Indeed, the, the scientist claims that science has proven determinism are self-defeating. 
right? Just as the Calvinist claims that the Bible proves determinism, well, those are self-defeating. They are, they're both in the same sinking ship. The free-thinking argument exposes the fact that if determinism is true, then metaphysical beliefs are fully explained by way of non-rational or untrustworthy antecedent conditions. And that would include the belief that libertarian freedom does not exist or the belief that exhaustive determinism is true. Well, if that's the case, then the beliefs that libertarian freedom does not exist and determinism is true, those beliefs are not justified. Those are non-justified beliefs if determinism is true. Thus, claiming that determinism is true and that humanity does not possess the libertarian freedom to think is ultimately self-defeating and a suicidal assertion. Now, speaking of suicide, John Polkinghorne was a theoretical physicist and also a great theologian who realized this metaphysical truth. Uh, I've got a quote from him. Let me get this. Um, yeah, so this uh, Polkinghorne is a renowned scientist who realized the, the limits of science. But here's, here's a quote I love. He says, uh, quote, I do believe that in the end, the denial of human libertarian freedom is incoherent because it destroys rationality. On its own terms, its very utterance, though purporting to be reasoned, is no more than the mouthing of an automaton. Like all extreme critiques born of the hermeneutics of suspicion, it ultimately proves to be suicidal. End quote. That's from his book, Reason and Reality. Well, we can also add to the following argument based upon Victor Reppert's work, which is, again, based upon C.S. Lewis's argument from reason. And we can add this to our cumulative metaphysical case. So this would be derived from Reppert's, uh, Victor Reppert's work. Premise one, no metaphysical belief is justified if it can be fully explained as the result of non-rational or untrustworthy antecedent conditions. Two, if determinism is true, then all metaphysical beliefs can be fully explained as the result of non-rational or untrustworthy antecedent conditions. Three, therefore, if determinism is true, then no metaphysical belief is justified. Four, determinism is a metaphysical belief. Five, therefore, the belief that determinism is true is not justified. So J.B.S. Haldane, who I believe was an atheist, uh, wrote the following, quote, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true, and hence I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. So on a related note, I've got to say this. Uh, with Haldane's words in mind, consider the same line of reasoning, but applied to exhaustive divine determinism. And I know I'm not talking, we're, we're focused on science right now, but I just want to add this. Um, so we can uh, say it this way. If my mental processes, which form my theological beliefs, are determined wholly by a deity of deception, even if the deity has morally sufficient reasons to deceive all humanity, well, then I have no reason to suppose my theological beliefs are true, and hence, I have no reason for supposing my mental processes are determined by such a deity. So anyway, if, if one has no reason to believe X, then the belief in X is not justified. And Victor Reppert has noted, uh, he said, quote, if the truth of one's belief makes it unjustified, this surely would make the belief a prime candidate for rejection, end quote. So as these metaphysical arguments demonstrate, if determinism is true, then the belief that antecedent conditions determine all things is not justified. So thus, a rational and reasonable person ought to reject determinism, even if determinism is affirmed on the front page of the New York Times or proclaimed on CNN. It would be the epitome of disinformation, misinformation, and just plain fake news. And this brings me to my third and final point on this uh, hostage crisis or this held hostage objection. And that's point number three. Uh, so science opposes determinism. So if Fisher and other compatibilists are so concerned with what scientists think about this topic, even if it's the wrong tool, right? Well, even if you're still committed to the wrong tool, then you should still reject determinism. A seeming majority of scientists today affirm the indeterminacy of quantum mechanics. 
And if the quantum realm is not deterministic, then exhaustive determinism, including exhaustive divine determinism, is false. If these actual scientists in the real world today are not enough to persuade the determinist to give up his exhaustive divine determinism, then why should a possible New York Times headline that does not actually exist be enough to convince anyone else uh, to the contrary, even if it existed in a possible future, right? Now, now, many have appealed to limit experiments to suggest that humanity does not possess libertarian freedom, uh, even, even if the quantum realm is indeterministic, but this flies in the face of further discoveries. Uh, you know, uh, Matt Flummer and Taylor Sear have had multiple guests on their show, the Free Will Show, talking about how these limit experiments uh, do not uh, show that determinism is true and, and, and leave room for libertarian freedom. Um, but anyway, uh, limit experiments are focused upon uh, quick reactive choices, but they do not touch important choices. And this is especially true when it comes to thinking things through over the course of a period of a long period of time. Uh, what we discussed uh, is called rational deliberation, right? To, uh, this uh, thinking things through over the course of time to eventually infer the best metaphysical or theological inference after examining all the data and thinking about it for a while, right? Those limit experiments don't touch that kind of thinking, this rational deliberation. So that I've argued at length, uh, that kind of thinking, uh, rational deliberation to make rational inferences requires libertarian free thinking. So anyway, in summary, uh, my response to the hostage crisis is threefold. Number one, science is the wrong tool for the job. Number two, the free thinking argument and the arguments from reason provide reason to reject potential ignorant claims of scientists. And three, if one is still committed to using the wrong tool, science still stands against exhaustive determinism. So bottom line, I'm not worried about the possibility of scientists proclaiming that they have proven determinism is true. If this unlikely event happens in the future, we can offer the free thinking argument and other metaphysical arguments in response, demonstrating that the science is wrong. <laughs> but with that said, the truth of the matter is that scientists seem to be demonstrating that determinism is false, especially when it comes to quantum mechanics and human deliberation over periods of time regarding important topics like metaphysical and theological topics. So, with that said, so much for Ed Calvinism and the so-called reason to be a compatibilist. Uh, so, that is to say, this reason to be a compatibilist is an escape from reason. It destroys one's ability to reason to be a compatibilist in the first place. It's suicidal. It's self-refuting. It's irrational.